Oh, hello. A reading from Matthew 7, 24 to 27. The wise and foolish builders. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came, the streams rose, the wind blew and beat against the house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, the wind blew and beat against that house and it fell with a great crash. We spent the last few weeks looking at the book of Nehemiah. We've been thinking about how to rebuild our lives with perspective that remembers the character of God. We've been learning how to rebuild our lives on the promises of God. We've been thinking about how to rebuild our lives on the purposes, the true purpose of the temple. We've been thinking about how to rebuild our lives on prayer. And most of all, we've been thinking about how to rebuild our lives on the cornerstone of Jesus Christ. But here in Jesus' story, we have two people who at least know that they want to build a house. So if we take that analogy seriously, both of these people are actually builders who are wanting to follow Christ. They know Christ. They read their Bible. They know about forgiveness, love, service. So the real question is, what is the difference between the wise Christian who builds on the rock and the foolish Christian who builds on sand? How do you know Christian, believer, follower of the way, whether you are a foolish or a wise builder. You see, both are wanting to know God. They're both wanting to rebuild, like I said, on the perspectives, the promises, the prayer. What is the real difference between the two? Perhaps we're asking the wrong question. What's the difference between rock and sand? The the physics teacher in me is thinking about that one. Rock is hard, it's cold, it's uncomfortable and if you fall on it you can really hurt yourself. Sand on the other hand is great to lie down on, great to play in, to roll about in. Let's face it, wouldn't we all want to be somewhere sunning ourselves on some beautiful sandy beach? In one sense the rock and the sand are essentially made of the same substance. It's just that one has been pulverised down, worn down into minuscule pieces to the point that it can no longer provide the security, the foundations that it once did. Perhaps then it's a question of noticing that the substance is the same, but the properties, the form, the function, the capacity, the risk factors are quite different. Boy, oh boy, have we discovered over this past year, how much have we learned that coming to a church building is not a requirement of a Christian, a follower of Christ. Singing is not a must. Coffee and donuts is not essential, believe it or not. Hanging out with people who reflect us, who soothe us, who help us feel that we've got it together and we're a-okay. All of it is lulling us into this false sense of security that trusts in our skills, our contacts, our paychecks and our children's achievements far, far more than it trusts in Jesus. In the end, it is all sad. Whilst it's all good and pleasant stuff, benign even, it cannot sustain us when the storms come. And we need to become aware of our true condition, condition because it absolutely needs pulverising. The truth is, we are fragile. We are vulnerable. We are touchable. We are hurtable. We are changeable. We are broken. We are human. 
tiny beings on this third rock from this random sun in this ever expanding universe. Yes, still the God of that universe is good enough to listen to you and I. Yes, still he chose to step down from heaven to live in the mire of this human weakness to show us some solidarity. And in the end, it's that that makes you and I significant. Nothing else, beloved. Nothing else. You see, God has seen fit to pulverise all the sandy bits of our faith. The bit that told us that we were entitled to protection, to special treatment because we're different, we're unique, we're friendly, we're nice people. That we were on some level entitled to that freedom because of our gentleness or because of our faithfulness because we've known Jesus for a long time because we've done the right thing we've been good citizens even our religion can become a futile attempt to box God to try and control him to help us deal with our fear and our uncertainty so we create these protected little spaces, our churches, our friendship groups, places of safety. But the truth is, they're not safe. They're sand. Whilst the one we profess to love was out there running the streets and roughing it in the countryside, don't you know that the whole world belongs to God? And my friends, he wants it all back. So why are you so fearful of that world? It's his backyard and he is your daddy. So you are safe in his presence alone. Don't you know that the temple leaders were properly offended by Jesus's truth? His insight to the kingdom of God. They're desperately trying to get Jesus to be who they need him to be. Desperately wanting him to accept their version of events, to affirm their setup and be some sort of celebrity friend. Meanwhile, he's out there healing on Sabbaths and liberating people. That totally vexed them. They're offended by him. So let's consider what has remained. What has remained? There's prayer, there's scripture, there's personal worship, quiet time. Maybe the corporate discussions and dialogues that have helped us focus on Christ and a deep, deep awareness of how much you and I need God. So what are you telling us, Natasha? What's the advice here? <sighs> My advice is build on Christ. Not on piety or dogma. Not on philosophy or religion. Not on culture or cult not on politics or personality or leaders or likes or fear or even your confidence. It's not on your social acceptance or your comfort level, your painlessness, your state, your citizenship, your status. You can't even rely on your gender, your ethnicity, your sex sexuality, your family, your education, your income, your job title, your assets. I want to ask you, are you able to count all of these things as loss? As you drill down, beloved, drill down through the dross to get to the rock beneath. It's about counting as loss all of those things that you have been told were really important that you took for granted, all of the dross, all of the fake news, the false truth and assumptions, the narratives that you've been told about your nation, your community, your patriotism, your rightness compared to everyone else's wrongness. You need to drill down, down, deep dive down to find him and take account of that which draws you away. Because if God is who he said he is, and I believe he is. What do you really have to fear? Really? By drilling down, by asking those difficult questions of those difficult parts of our faith, 
and really learning to trust him in the process. I'm not saying that you're going to get the answer at the same time, but he's the source, the source of all source. So he must know. And who else, after all, can we ask? My advice to you is build solely on Christ as the rock. His, the solidity of his identity, the consistency of his character, his trustworthiness. He's of one substance with the Father. He is saviour, he is healer, he's the redeemer of all sin. Let me tell you about a little story about how you learn that you're building on sand so you can make a choice to build on rock. I have a dear friend, a netball buddy, a partner in Christ and crime and also raving. A gentle spirit, a diligent woman, a single parent mother. One day, skin cancer popped up for the second time. So I prayed and we prayed, the church prayed, the team prayed. And on her best day, she would say, we are blessed. And on her worst day, she would say, God is good. It became clear that God had different plans. So we as friends agreed to play, pray in alignment with his will, even though it wasn't ours. Friends, she died on her son's third birthday. It was her favourite day of the year and it's now nailed to his worst day. And so early on in my walk, I learned that my faith, my religion, my faithfulness, my prayerfulness is not here to protect me from the pain, the suffering and the loss of this life. That is not the purpose of your Christianity or mine. God alone became my confidence, my comfort. I mean, I fell with a crash. I could pray for great jobs and parking spaces and parties and just events and opportunities. I fell with a crash because there's sometimes God says, no, what are you going to do about that? I realised that my house was built on sand, faithful as I was, on fire for Jesus as I was. My house was built on sand. And through that experience, I got up and learned to build upon a rock. At her funeral, I had the privilege of sharing the following Bible passage. It comes from Job 19, 25 to 27. You see, I know that my Redeemer lives. And in the end, I will stand upon a rock. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh, I will see God. I myself will see him with mine own eyes. I am not another. How my heart yearns within me. Let's pray. Lord, I invite you. Help us to be wise. To stand upon your rock. Help us to notice when we are playing and building sand castles. Free us from being fearfully bound and offended, trapped by judgment about your world. Whether it's sacred or secular, it belongs to you. You perfect it and make it good. Remind us that all of it originally belonged to you because you alone are the source. So help us to not be so insular, not be so small-minded, defensive, fearful, exclusive, so that in our flesh, we might take the risk to climb and stand and ask and trust God in amongst all the uncertainty. That we might receive the grace to
to see God in our flesh, in our innermost being. Amen.